Africa was hit especially hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. Across most of the continent, health measures were insufficient. Many African countries received vaccines late and in meager quantities. How did people there cope and what solutions did they find? That's what we're highlighting in this week's edition of the COVID-19 Special Report. Welcome. But first, we take a look at India, where health department employees are getting ready to roll out a nasal vaccine. The aim is to make vaccine injections a thing of the past. This vaccination center in New Delhi can immunize up to 300 people a day. But doctors say lately only a few people show up daily. Today, Dr. Richa Gautam, who heads the center, says that they expect that to change soon. She thinks the newly developed nasal vaccine will increase the number of vaccinations at the center. Since the vaccine is to be administered in the spray or aerosol forms, this will not require any injection technique, which is invasive. In the logistic part also, we don't need to uh, maintain all the biomedical waste uh, terms uh, like hub cutter and the syringes and needles, which will be curbed down with the introduction of this vaccine. Like this center, many other vaccination facilities in India are also awaiting their first batch of nasal vaccines. A few kilometers away, this hospital in Delhi regularly carries out vaccination trials. Dr. Anupam Sachdeva, a vaccine expert, says the newly developed nasal vaccine could be a game changer in curbing COVID. COVID intranasal vaccine will make sure that there are border guards in the nose. So your infiltration, that's SARS-CoV-19, will be neutralized at the border itself. It will not be allowed to enter the body. India is known as the world's largest vaccine manufacturer. With the recent development of a nasal vaccine by the homegrown company Bharat Biotech, the country hopes that the new delivery system will become a long-term solution to respiratory infection. Concerned with the dip in vaccination numbers, Dr. Sunila Garg, who heads the government-appointed COVID task force, is confident that the nasal vaccine can help in mass immunization campaigns and fight vaccine hesitancy. We are privileged that India is the first country to have the nasal vaccine, and it's a historic moment. We still have, you know, a huge population across different continents which is yet to be immunized. So that's where it can play a very, very critical role in faster immunization. As the world continues to witness sporadic surges of the COVID-19 virus, several other countries are developing nasal vaccines with some of them in their final trial phases. But India is one of the few countries which has already approved its emergency use to curb COVID-19. At the outset of the COVID-19 pandemic, many countries struggled to carry out enough PCR tests in such a short time. They couldn't tell who had the virus and might pass it on. But scientists in the West African country of Ghana used the strategy of pool testing. It's caught on worldwide. A team of virologists at work at this biomedical lab in Ghana's capital, Accra. Virologist William Ampofo heads the team that's based at the University of Ghana's Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research. Here, he and his colleagues spent hours testing samples at the start of the pandemic. So for COVID-19, we take respiratory samples, we go to the other labs, we extract the RNA, then we add reagents, to be able to amplify the RNA of the SARS-CoV-2, and then we come and put it in these thermal cyclists, and then we run for about an hour and a half, two hours, and then we're able to have a clear indication by looking at uh, graphs that are produced 
because the material is amplified during the process. So we call this real-time uh, PCR, polymerase chain reaction. When COVID first came to Ghana, the country struggled to produce test results quickly. It lacked adequate infrastructure and staff, and that only heightened people's anxiety. So Ampofo and his team procured logistics and reagents to set up their lab and start testing. They used a pooling system, which enabled them to test some 10,000 samples a day. So the pool testing principle is very simple. If you have 10 samples, okay, and then you take a little bit of each of each sample and then you put it into one tube. So you test this one tube. When you test this tube and it's negative, then it means all the 10 samples are negative. Okay, but if you test this one sample, this uh, one that has all, all the 10 pooled in it, if you test this one and it is positive, then that means that one of the 10 is positive. So you have to find out which one. So you have to unpool. This approach made Ghana one of the African countries that carried out the most tests per 100,000 people. It helped Ghana's COVID-19 response team to better understand the spread of the disease and adapt their strategies accordingly, saving many lives. And that's attracted the attention of other scientists. It's interesting that at the end of the day, even our colleagues from Europe and northern countries started uh, um, implementing the pooling system. And so for me, we can't feel anything but to feel good because we showed leadership, we showed direction, and I think that is what Noguchi is about. Young scientists here are inspired by the opportunity to work with Ampofo and learn how to combat COVID. You know, this pandemic has been so, so serious. It has taken like a lot of lives, knowing that you are partaking in like a very vital role in producing results, testing to save lives. I must say that it has been a really massive response to this pandemic. Lessons drawn from fighting COVID-19 are also helping Ampofo and his team deal with other deadly viruses. We're very happy that uh, we rose to the challenge. Uh, We're very happy that we continue to provide uh, support to the Ghana Health Service, the Ministry of Health, not just for COVID-19, but when we had cases of monkeypox, when we had Marburg virus detected. William Ampofo and his colleagues are determined to play their part in helping Ghana win the fight against COVID-19. Even as the COVID-19 Delta variant was killing tens of thousands in her home country, South Africa, Zanele Gule never thought she'd be affected. But after catching COVID, she ended up in hospital. Luckily, her husband stayed healthy and took care of her while working during the entire pandemic. That's how they escaped the economic consequences that drove many of their compatriots to ruin. A new episode in our My COVID series. We didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know how many people were going to pass away. We didn't know who was going to pass away. We didn't know if we were going to be alive. My name is Zanele Gule. I live in Johannesburg and I had COVID-19. I was infected with COVID-19 in June 2021. My symptoms were the normal flu symptoms, uh, but I rapidly deteriorated. I started to feel breathless. I tried to get um, a hospital. I couldn't get into a hospital in Johannesburg. The, the hospitals were fully booked. I had to be taken by ambulance to a, a neighboring a hospital in Pretoria, and uh, I was admitted for a week. I didn't talk too much to my doctor because I was very nervous, and the clinic itself was very busy. My actual COVID symptoms lasted for six months. However, I still experience some symptoms like tiredness, um, memory loss. We lost people, we watched television and lost so many friends and family. So it was um, a very bitter and difficult time. But for me, it was also nice that I could be at home with my husband and uh, just reconnect. 
in order to protect myself against COVID today, I make sure that I eat uh, very well. I have a balanced diet. I have my breakfast, my lunch, my supper. I include a lot of greens in my diet. I also um, exercise by walking. When I got COVID, I was not vaccinated. And the reason for that is because of the negative publicity about the vaccinations. But my experience of being hospitalized was an eye opener. Uh, I decided to get vaccinated just to avoid having, you know, another experience. And staying in South Africa, just like in the rest of the world, many people there complain of ongoing symptoms known as long COVID. In addition to the physical effects, the psychological consequences are also becoming clear. It can even lead to a permanent inability to work. Simple tasks like getting out of bed in the morning have become a challenge for Yvonne Chengwe. Not long after my COVID-19 infection, uh, which was last year, June, I developed uh, excruciating pain under my feet, which made it difficult for me to walk and to stand for long periods of time. Immediately after that, I started developing some anxiety and uh, depression. A single mother and business owner, Chengwe was forced to shut down her shop during South Africa's COVID lockdown, one of the strictest in the world. As a massage therapist, her profession requires her to be on her feet all day long. But her lingering symptoms have made it impossible for her to return to work. After losing my business and my income, it was very hard. I had to give up my rental apartment to move in with my partner in order to save some money. And um, since there's this uncertainty of not knowing when I'll be able to resume my practice, I decided to enroll for a course teaching English as a second language online. Yvonne Chengwe is not alone. More than 4 million South Africans have so far tested positive for COVID-19, and at least 10% of them will develop longer-term symptoms, according to the country's National Institute for Communicable Diseases. That means at least 400,000 people still battling with COVID-related symptoms six months or more after their initial diagnosis. Samantha Angkor is one of them. Let's do I was in hospital for a total of 10 weeks, six of those in ICU. I struggled with short of breath um, issues, also cognition and memory issues. Her and symptoms continued for 11 months. During this time, she was unable to work, so she registered for temporary disability assistance. Luckily, she has health insurance and was referred to a private rehabilitation center in Johannesburg. Okay, that's fine. That's we offer a holistic, client-centered approach uh, for long COVID patients. We offer occupational therapy, physiotherapy, and speech therapy for those patients. We've seen an increase in referrals of people who've had long COVID and who are struggling months down the line. Samantha Ancor has gone from being on oxygen 24-7 to being able to return to work full-time. It's changed my life. My memory is better, my cognition issues are gone, and I'm just a different person now. Rehab Matters is one of a handful of facilities in South Africa treating long COVID. It's a private practice and caters to people who either have health insurance or can afford to pay out of pocket. Altogether, just 27% of the population. For the other 40 million plus South Africans who rely on public health care, like Yvonne Chengwe, treatment options are limited. In South Africa, there is no way of knowing just how many people are suffering from long COVID. The reason for this is there's a wide variety of symptoms that can include pain, other physical weakness, and even memory. 
For people who do not have access to private rehab facilities, there is only one government-funded facility. However, that is in Cape Town. So most of the cases are going untreated. But Cape Town is a long way from Johannesburg, where Yvonne Chengwe lives. She eventually found relief through acupuncture a form of alternative therapy that is practiced in Chinese medicine. Regarded by some as a pseudoscience, its medical credibility is disputed. But for Yvonne, it's making a difference without breaking the bank. It's my second time here, and uh, I opted for this after being told by Western doctors that they could not do anything for the pain in my feet that I developed after my COVID. And the, the reason was that there's lots of people who are presenting with different uh, co problems after COVID. And uh, so they just write it down to long COVID and uh, there's nothing really they can do at the moment. And I came here and the pain in my feet has eased a lot. And I feel there is hope. Okay, how you feel? I feel so much better, thank you. <laughs> okay, so the do doctor right now give you two types of the medication to use. This uh, one is to drink. Yeah. It will help you to release the pain and for the circulations. Mm -hmm. While she is still on the road to recovery, she's optimistic that she'll soon be able to reopen her business and return to normal life. Why do some people get really sick from the coronavirus even though they're young, fit and healthy? That's not really clear yet. But one answer might lie in a person's genes. Researchers from the Berlin Institute of Health at Berlin's Charité Hospital have presented a new study. Our colleague Christina Küffner talked to Dr. Mike Pietzner about it. What exactly predisposes people to severe infection? So clinicians noted early on that um, severe COVID-19 occurs more often in older people or in male people, and particularly in those who are overweight, but also in those who come with multiple pre-existing conditions like type 2 diabetes or cardiovascular diseases. Um, however, we do see these severe COVID-19 cases also among apparently healthy subjects or, or patients, which means there must be something else to it. And early studies showed that in patients with rare um, mutations in, in genes that are responsible for the immune system, they were more often affected for so severe COVID-19. How much influence do uh, our genes actually have? In brief, it's supposed to be modest. It's, the first thing you, you need to understand is that genes aren't active elements. Genes are blueprints for what is called proteins. And proteins are the ones who actually do the action, who facilitate life and um, enable us to react to a viral infection. Um, and what other studies have identified are regions in the genome that code for those proteins related to the immune system or to lung function. And if this varies, so the blueprint varies a bit, doesn't it need to be a major variation, very, very tiny, very common ones. Um, puts you at a higher risk for COVID-19 or severe COVID-19 in particular. In collaboration with other researchers, your group just published a new study on this issue. What is it about? So what we saw is there are about eight proteins that seem to have a role either in as uh, predisposing you to a more severe COVID-19 outcome, but also to uh, seem to have a protective role. So we have, for instance, identified a protein called ELF5, which is expressed in specific lung cells that are also the target of the virus. And if you have more of this protein in your cells, you're more likely to develop severe COVID-19. Um, and then on the other hand, we identified proteins like um, GCSF, um, which have a role in the immune response. And patients who have higher levels of this protein seem to be a bit more protected. Um, against severe COVID-19. So given the knowledge available, can we translate it into better treatment strategies? So I think our study contributes a small piece to a larger puzzle. So, so what we identify is some, some basic knowledge like ELA5 and how this may relate to the wound repair upon infection in the lung, which isn't quite clear yet. 
Um, and I found it quite exciting to at least name some potential drug targets because it's really difficult to develop drugs anyway. So it usually takes decades. And now we need to do this within like months or only a couple of years. And I think by bringing together all these different um, data, we, we might highlight some, some new uh, candidate proteins that might be worthwhile following up. Mm -hmm. Dr. Pietzner, thank you for talking to us. Thank you. Bye. In the Ivory Coast, keeping track of medical records is a real problem. Files often get lost and have to be recreated, making monitoring developments over time nearly impossible. A clinic in the city of Doku has decided to try out an innovative patient-centered approach. The large Doku clinic has decided to test a new solution. They're using a new electronic health booklet. This is the Muso Health Pass. It's a small bracelet containing a person's health history. The clinic adopted this device in 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic to deal with any emergencies. There are patients who come who are unconscious. If they have the electronic bracelet, we have all their information in one click. There are also patients who come in who can't speak French. This type of patient can give us the information via the Musso Pass. The bracelet was invented here. In 2014, entrepreneur Corinne Watera decided to launch her idea using the profits from her textile workshop. Since then, a team of developers has been stationed right next to the sewing machines. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the need for new e-health solutions, there's been renewed interest in the Muso Pass. During the health crisis, people understood that barriers have to be broken down, which means that distances in care should no longer exist. We need to use e-health, teleconsultation, tele-expertise and home care. To ensure that the health records are secure, the team has put several levels of security in place. They also receive a message as soon as their personal information is accessed. As soon as someone logs onto the interface to see your information, you get a message like this one. Then access to the platform, to the server, and the team gets renewed. We're 100% dedicated to working on all aspects of the platform's data security. Today, Corinne Watera would like her solution to be deployed throughout the Ivory Coast. Thanks to a partnership with the Ivory Coast Post Office, she's traveling across the country to raise awareness about the pass. The first stop is Seguela, a town in the northwest of the country. The aim is to campaign there and convince 200 women to adopt the Muso Pass. You see what I have in my hand here is a bracelet that I wear. But it's not a normal bracelet, it's my health book. It means that all my information is in it. So why is that? Because if I leave here, I could have an accident. And if the doctors want to help me, they need to know that I'm asthmatic, I have sinusitis and a history of epilepsy. At €4.50 Euros for the bracelet and €3 Euros for the card, the prices are simply too expensive for many who live here. But today is the only opportunity to get this nationally accepted health ID. If you're in a small village and have a problem, the doctors there can save you quickly. That means your life is always safe. But when you don't have a health ID, it's really not good. Corinne's speech was convincing and bears fruit. The enthusiasm was so great that the Muso Health Pass teams were quickly overwhelmed. Do you know your blood type? What is it? A positive. A total of 350 people were enrolled that day.
Corinne feels reassured because even though COVID-19 infections have slowed down in the country, the pass could help in dealing with any new waves. If the crisis comes back, we'll be asked which people have been infected in the past. They will ask for a history of the patients, and that's also important with the pass because it traces everything. Have I ever been infected with COVID? Am I a person who is susceptible to the disease? Even though there are now just under 82,000 positive cases in the country, Corinne wants to remain mobilized. Her trip will continue to four more cities. That was this week's COVID-19 special report focusing on African countries. See you next week. Until then, bye-bye and stay healthy.